Okay, let's take a look at an example of an activity-based costing problem that is kind of a little bit more broad than what your book shows. And I'll post a copy of this on uh, Canvas as well. So in this particular case, we have uh, we work for a company called Oli Homes, and of course this is a fictional problem. And we have their actual income statement for the year, which shows they had sales of $19,700. And you can see it's in contribution margin format, and they ended up with $390,000 on, uh, on their bottom line as net income. I express this as a percentage, so this is uh, a way to compare to a benchmark, which is what an average builder might look like. And again, this is a fictional problem. So we can see here that their contribution margin is very, uh, let's say, identical to what the benchmark is. So they're doing a good job with their pricing and their cost control for building homes. Uh, but when we look at their overhead, we can see that they're spending more on wages and benefits than the average uh, company, which causes them to have a lower profitability, 2% versus 5%. Uh, than what the average builder would have. And you might think, well, 3%, that's not much. Well, 3% of $19,700 is $591,000. That's an awful lot of money to leave on the table if you're the owner of this company. So we dig down a little bit deeper and we say, what is this $2,300,100 comprised of? And I can look at this drafting wages, purchasing, uh, superintendents and office staff and then the officers of the company. That's how it is made up. So I'm going to dig down into this deeper to see where a problem might exist. So I look at the different types of wages and, and vehicle expense and say that I can come up, those are activities that I can look at associated with different neighborhoods. So in this particular case here I look at drafting and it's based on the number of changes that are made to a house. So we have standard plans and we only need drafting resources when we deviate from those standard plans. So in this case, I have uh, a number of houses sold in each of these three neighborhoods, again, all made up names, and how many changes were required for each house. It looks like Eagle Point, the customers do an awful lot of customization of their homes. So I have 22 design changes, 20, and then 40 for a total of 82 design changes that were made over the course of the year. So using activity-based costing, I can take the total cost of that divided by the number of changes made, and I can get $3,900 per design change. And then I can apply that to each of the neighborhoods here. The next one I'll look at are purchasing cost. So those are based on purchase orders per house. So in some cases, we build kind of a standard vanilla house and we can issue just a couple of purchase orders to our suppliers. In some cases, there's a lot of customization that goes on, like an Eagle Point. So we have to issue a lot of different purchase orders. So I do the same thing. I multiply the number of houses built times the purchase orders per house to get the total purchase orders uh, issued for the year. Divide that by the total cost of the purchasing department and I get $16.15 per purchase order. I can apply that then to the design changes made per house. Next one I look at are wages for superintendents. Those are the guys that drive around and make sure everything is working right on the different building sites. So how many site visits are required for each house? How often do they have to show up and check on things? So in the case of Wood Creek and Stonegate, it's 20 visits per construction of a home. In Eagle Point, because there's all this customization, they have to show up all the time to make sure things are on the right track. Okay, So again, I do the multiplication. I find out that it's 1,090 sites to homes. Divide that by the wages for superintendents. I get $385 per visit to a house site. Again, I can do the math there to apply that to each of the three different neighborhoods. I'm allocating the cost of these superintendents to the neighborhoods in which they work. Lastly, I look at vehicle expense. So that's also based on the number of sites to each home. So I can take my vehicle expense and divide that by 1,090 visits, and I get the total for each neighborhood, $110 per each visit. That's tires and insurance and gas and, all, and, and depreciation on the truck, all of that. So now that I've been able to apply overhead to these different neighborhoods, I can now look at an income statement by neighborhood. So I take a look at sales, and I get the sales for each of the three neighborhoods that totals the 19,000 or 19,700,000. 
and I've got my variable cost. That's pretty easy to track to individual uh, neighborhoods, land and materials and direct labor, sales commissions to real estate agents that sell the homes, and then other variable charges, maybe permits and things like that, that I can allocate to those different neighborhoods because I know what I spent money on, which neighborhood I was working in for each of those. So now I've got a contribution margin, and as you can see, that's pretty consistent across the board, 30% in each case. So it doesn't appear that I have a pricing problem based on direct variable cost. So now I look at the segment cost, and here where I go back to the previous page, and I allocate the drafting wages to the neighborhoods. I allocate the purchasing wages to the neighborhood based on the activity-based costing rates I came up with. Same thing with supervisor wages and same thing with vehicle expense. And then advertising, I was able to keep track of how much I spent on advertising each of the different neighborhoods in social media and in the paper and those sorts of things. So I can come up with the total segment cost for each of these. And again, I'm coming up with all of these figures here based on activity-based rates. So now I can look and see that the segment margin, how much I'm earning in each, in each neighborhood before applying common cost, I'm doing pretty well in Wood Creek, pretty, pretty well in Stonegate, but you can see I'm losing money in Eagle Point. I would actually be better off if I didn't have that neighborhood. My sales would be lower, but my profitability would be higher if I didn't have that neighborhood. Then I subtract the common costs like office wages, officer salaries, depreciation, office expense, and legal fees, and I come down to the same $390,000 that I had on my overall income statement. So this allows me, by using activity-based costing and really applying the burden to these different neighborhoods I'm operating, and you can think of it almost as different product lines, by applying that burden appropriately based on the activities that are required by those neighborhoods, I can see that my problem is in Eagle Point. So I need to either do one of two things. I either need to charge more for the homes that are sold in that area, I need a higher contribution margin to support the higher segment cost, or I need to figure out how to restrict the choices customers are making to reduce the types of segment costs that I'm incurring in that neighborhood. But I've been able to, using this method, identify where the problem exists and offer some potential solutions. So I hope you found that helpful. Thank you. As always, please email or call if you have any questions and I'll post this document on Canvas as well. Thank you.